Major funding for NJTV News is provided in part by RWJ Barnabas Health. Let's be healthy together. NJM Insurance Group, serving the insurance needs of New Jersey residents and businesses for more than 100 years. And Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, an independent licensee of the Blue Cross and Blue Shield Association. Tonight on NJTV News, learning from history. A uniquely New Jersey program to promote the teaching of African American history holds its annual Summer Institute at Kane University. A new program inside this jail aims to help inmates suffering from addiction here in Monmouth County. Finding quality child care is hard enough without having to worry so much about how to pay for it. A youth leadership program, a partnership in Newark, pairs high school students with the U.S. Naval Academy. Plus, those ghost gun blueprints won't be available online for now. A small concession or a big win? Those stories are more next on NJTV News. Live from the Agnes Barris NJTV studio at 2 Gateway Center in Newark, this is NJTV News with Mary Alice Williams. Hello, thank you for joining us. New Jersey is ahead of other states in formally fostering African-American history. The state's Amistad commissions training middle and high school teachers the history that stands at the intersection of civil rights and public education. Chief political correspondent Michael Aaron reports. About 100 educators at a four-day workshop. It's part of the Amistad commission's annual summer institute. The Amistad was a ship carrying slaves who revolted in 1839. In 2002, then Assemblyman William Payne Jr. got a law passed named for the Amistad that mandated the teaching of African American history in all New Jersey public schools. The 23 member Amistad Commission meets quarterly to promote and protect that law. Former Patterson Mayor Jeff Jones is a member of the commission. Many of our young people, particularly African Americans, um, have a sense of lack of identity, that I'm just here. Once you begin to crack that seam and begin to understand, no, you're not just here. There's a purpose why you're here. You live here. You have contributions to make. There are things you can do. You'll see change. You'll see reductions in crime. You'll see more students want to go on to uh, professional careers. The literature on the table conveys what the conference is about. What is history? Brown versus Board of Education. New film Rosenwald tells story of Jewish philanthropists who transformed black lives. Where did all the black teachers go? What it means to be black in the American educational system. If all students around the country were made aware of the contributions of African Americans, a lot of the issues that we're having now would not be taking place at all. An understanding of history is the bedrock of the Amistad law. We were told that the, everybody on the plantation was very happy. We understand now that that's not true. So it's, it's important for our, our students to know just what has happened from 1619 to the present and the impact that it has on their self-identity. The Amistad Commission is a state agency in but not of the State Department of Education. Its executive director, Dr. Stephanie Harris, says no other state has gone to the lengths New Jersey has to foster African-American history. Right now we have three other states that have actually passed the law. I sit here in front of you as still the only executive director in the nation that actually has done this work. We have no other states that have actually taken it on with such a seriousness and veracity that they've actually created an office that actually operationalizes that mandate. This was day two at Kane. Last week, Rowan hosted a South Jersey equivalent. So here's one more way New Jersey leads the nation, not in property taxes, not in foreclosures, but in having a mandate to teach African-American history for the sake of a good society. At Kane University in Union, I'm Michael Aaron, and JTV News. The controversial company that on its website promoted releasing blueprints for 3D printed ghost guns tomorrow has made a concession. Defense Distributed has agreed not to upload to its website any new blueprint files pending a hearing in September, but it won't take down any existing files. 
None are now accessible from a New Jersey IP address. New Jersey was one of eight states that sued the Trump administration for allowing the blueprints to be published online. And Attorney General Gabriel Graywall is calling the concession a big win. But Defense Distributed told us the Attorney General's motion for a temporary restraining order was denied and that their concession is voluntary. Earlier today, President Trump tweeted he'd spoken to the NRA about it, and a group of Democratic senators, including Bob Menendez, unveiled new legislation to address the dangers of the untraceable plastic weapons. Monmouth County prosecutors are rolling out a first-in-the-state effort to put people convicted of drug-related crimes in treatment while they're serving time. Leah Mishkin reports on this latest effort to reduce the recidivism that contributes to New Jersey's drug addiction crisis. Philip O'Hara spent 10 days at this correctional facility in 2011 for a DUI case. He says the pod across from this one is where he stayed in a cell with another inmate. Both of them were addicted to opioids. And he says it only took him a few hours after he was released to go right back into it. In the moment I hit that gate, it was just like a ton of bricks. The first thing I did, it was almost like my car was on autopilot. Um, you went back into the drugs? Yeah, I went right back to where I knew to get something and got something. So, and I believe that if this was, you know, this was 2011 where when I went to go get was Oxycontin. If it was 2018, I would go get a bag of fentanyl-laced heroin and I would most likely not be having this interview. If you're behind bars, you're most likely addicted. And if you're addicted, you have a familiarity with the criminal justice system. Roughly 76% of the people who are booked into New Jersey County Correctional Facilities have a substance abuse disorder, according to the Monmouth County Sheriff. The most common cause of inmate death upon release is overdose. It's a fact. Monmouth County Correctional Institution has substance abuse counselors on the inside for those that are incarcerated in the system. But the sheriff says with bail reform, which eliminated the cash bail system for most criminal offenders last year, came some gaps in the system. It's made it tougher for individuals that have addiction um, because, again, they're here for 72 hours and being released. Not giving inmates a chance to detox or get the help they need. Until now, a new program here called Next Step wants to fill the gap by having peer recovery specialists inside the facility screening inmates before they're released. To be able to intervene hours after their arrest, hours after they've sobered up, they've come down from, from the drug event that they've overdosed from, and then they spend a night in jail away from their loved ones, that's pretty impactful. So even if the inmates are only here for a short period of time, they'll get the resources they need to give them the greatest opportunity to stay sober on the outside. They'll be connected to programs like New Jersey Reentry Corporation, which provide things like legal services, referrals to sober housing, and help with finding employment. If someone comes into the county jail facility and is suffering from addiction, we're going to identify that person and we're going to link that person to necessary treatment. Philip O'Hara says he used drugs every day for five years after he was released from this correctional facility all those years ago. He eventually overdosed on heroin in 2016, and that's when he got himself into treatment. Do you think in those 10 days, if you had someone there who would have offered you services, that you might not have spent those five years? I you think it would have been that turning point for you if you had someone there in those 10 days? I think it definitely would have gave me a fighting chance. I can't tell you what I would have said, um, but I know I would have had an opportunity that most people don't have. Um, and that's the point, you know, is some people aren't going to be ready. I don't know if I was ready at that point, but had I got arrested the night that I overdosed in 2016, which I just didn't, I didn't get Narcan, I didn't get arrested, I just woke up four hours later um, on a bathroom floor, um, that would have been the day that I would have accepted help. Walking these halls again, he kept saying how lucky he was to be given the chance to turn his life around. He's proud to be from Monmouth County, he says, on a day like today, where they led the state in a first-of-its-kind recovery program. In Freehold, Leia Mishkin, NJTV News. A surprise in the energy sector tops tonight's business news. Standing by at the Strategic Development Group studio at the NJCU School of Business is Rhonda Shafflett. Rhonda? Mary Alice, the Oyster Creek nuclear plant is being sold and will now be decommissioned much sooner than expected. Exelon has sold the plant in Lacey Township to Camden-based 
Holtec International, which specializes in nuclear and solar energy. The sale is for an undisclosed price. Holtec says the plant will be decommissioned in just eight years. That's about 50 years sooner than originally planned. Oyster Creek, the nation's oldest nuclear power plant, was scheduled to stop generating electricity in mid-September. This proposed deal would give Holtec ownership of about 800 acres of land and the plant's spent nuclear fuel. Holtec would also receive the $980 million decommissioning fund, which has been set aside for Oyster Creek's closure. Holtec intends to send those spent nuclear fuel rods to a facility in New Mexico. Once that is completed, Holtec would have unrestricted use of the site. Holtec says it does plan to offer jobs to the Exelon employees now working at Oyster Creek. This sale still has to be approved by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. New Jersey's housing market held steady in the second quarter of this year with prices rising and properties spending fewer days on the market. According to NJ Realtors, the median sales price of a single family home in June was $340,000. That's up 4.6 percent from last year. Single family homes spent an average of just 57 days on the market in June. That's down nearly 11 percent over last year as inventory remains low. The first major pro sports league has announced a sports betting commercial partnership with MGM Resorts, which owns Atlantic City's Borgata Casino. MGM will pay the National Basketball Association for data to use in various bets. The NBA's position has been that getting accurate statistics to bettors is critical so they know what they're betting on and casinos know when to pay out. MGM will be an official casino partner for the league, but it will not have exclusive rights to that data. The NBA will also advertise MGM casinos on its website and other media properties. For some time in New Jersey, state workers have been allowed to donate unused time off to a co-worker in need. Now, efforts are moving forward to convert that long-standing policy into law. The state Senate approved a bill that would allow those state workers with at least one year of continuous service to be eligible to receive donated leave. The bill would also make it easier to donate unused sick and vacation days to pregnant co-workers. The legisl legislation sponsored by Senator Loretta Weinberg heads next to the Assembly. Social media company Facebook says it has uncovered sophisticated efforts on its platforms to influence politics. The company says it removed 32 accounts from Facebook and Instagram because they were involved in coordinated political behavior and appeared to be fake. One of those accounts had 290,000 followers. Facebook stopped short of saying the effort was aimed at influencing the midterm elections in November. Facebook also said it doesn't know exactly who is behind the accounts, but there could be connections to Russia. On Wall Street, stocks bounce back from yesterday's losses. The Dow rose 108 points. And those are your top business stories. Support for the Business Report is provided by Atlantic City Electric, an Exelon company, connecting communities and powering southern New Jersey. Free community college starting as soon as the spring semester. With the goal of expanding New Jersey's talent pool, the State Secretary of Higher Education and Student Assistance Authority are inviting all 19 community colleges to apply for the pilot program launched today. The initial group of schools will be chosen based on their cost projections, geographic diversity, and how they'd reach out to and support students. Those eligible would have to carry at least six credits and earn less than $45,000 a year. The money for the first phase of the initiative has already been allocated in the state budget. The cost of raising children before they reach school age can also be staggering. In the third part of our series on New Jersey's cost of living, senior correspondent David Cruz looks at the impact of child care on working families who are still chasing the dream. Way before parents have gotten over that new baby smell, the meter on that bundle of joy has already started running. Nowadays, with pressure on parents to get back to work faster, finding competent child care that a working parent can afford is becoming harder and harder. Kirin Honda Garioso is with the United Way, which runs a project called ALICE, which stands for Asset Limited, Income Constrained and Employed. 
In New Jersey, child care is the largest item in an, for an Alice family and their survival budget. It's around $1,400 a month, and that's for two children. So child care is a tremendous burden. Yet we need our kids to be in safe, high-quality learning experiences and, and be able so that Alice families can work every day. That's about $17,000 a year for child care. On an income of thirty-five to 40000 that's almost half the household income. Throw in food, rent, transportation, etc., and, well, you get the idea. The cost of these basics, throw in housing, health care, and nutrition, has risen 23 percent from 2007 to 2014. Meanwhile, the average wage increased by only 14 percent over the same time span. Tell Nathaniel Beno all about it. She's a single mother of five, aged two, all the way up through college. For her older kids, she tried a number of options around Orange, where she lives, which didn't all meet her basic standards. The facility didn't seem very, very clean. It didn't seem as though they were being educated properly. So it just wasn't where I envisioned my children getting their first, their first look at the educational system. Yeah. So it just wasn't, it wasn't for me. Then a friend told her about this place, the West Orange Community House, a daycare center and Abbott District Preschool. Here, little ones have a gym to run around in, toys to play with, and three meals a day, all under the supervision of actual certified teachers. The community house accepts kids as young as 13 months, and when they're old enough, they move into the pre-K level, where the community house has 10 classrooms. Mary Lou Bruno is a preschool social worker who's been here for 20 years. We're getting them ready for kindergarten. Yeah. We, are, we make sure that our children, when they enter kindergarten, are more than ready to be successful. For most parents, affordability is a top priority. Bruno says after taking a parent on a tour of the facility recently, they got down to discussing dollars and cents. And she had this shocked look on her face, and I looked at her and she said, well, first of all, when I enter my child's classroom, I don't see the things I see here, like the reading areas that we have and the computers and the smart boards and uh, the block area. She was paying $1,000 a month for what she basically said was babysitting. Care for a child at the West Orange Community House, 8.30 a.m. to 5.30 p.m., two meals and a snack, plus pull-ups and diapers in some cases, is $685. The only way that's possible is with subsidies from government and from some nonprofits like Programs for Parents, which helps working parents afford child care. Without a subsidy, working parents like Nathaniel just wouldn't be able to afford even inexpensive alternatives like the community house. They're in a very bad dilemma, and then that's when they have to start looking to family and friends to see if they can pay someone to do that. Even with Governor Murphy moving New Jersey towards universal pre-K, Many working parents can't afford to wait for that. The fact is, the supply of quality child care is not meeting the demand, and that only forces the price to go up. In West Orange, I'm David Cruz, NJTV News. The cost of beach replenishment, that tops tonight's Garden State Express. Our first stop, Hereford Inlet, from where North Wildwood and Stone Harbor have been getting sand to replenish their beaches. Only now, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service is proposing to ban the use of federal dollars for non-emergency dredging, meaning the state and cities would have to foot the bill. The North Wildwood mayor calls the plan an overreach. Avalon, Stone Harbor, and even the Army Corps of Engineers have submitted letters of opposition to it and say they'll file a federal lawsuit, as they did in 2016. They settled back then after striking a deal to import sand from the Townsend's Inlet, which cost $6 million more. The Army Corps says if this year's ban moves forward, importing sand from elsewhere might cost even more than that. Next to Deal Lake, and don't go near the water, swimming is never allowed in Monmouth County's largest lake. But the county health department has posted signs urging people not to canoe or kayak in the 158-acre man-made lake either because of the presence of cyanobacteria, a blue-green algae created by stormwater runoff at high temperatures that can cause rashes, eye irritation, and headaches. It's harmful to both humans and pets. The lake water will be tested again Thursday to see if bacteria levels are low enough to remove the advisory signs. 
finally, Voorhees, where some two dozen six to nine year olds from the Camden County Boys and Girls Club got a cool down at an ice rink and an ice skating lesson to boot, along with instruction on concussion prevention and good nutrition. The workshop at the Virtual Flyer Skate Zone will be followed next week by a workout co-hosted by the Philadelphia 76ers, a three-day basketball clinic, Hoop Heaven. And that's the Garden State Express for Tuesday, July 31st. Something up in your neighborhood? Tip us off. While most students are savoring one final month of summer, St. Benedict students are learning lessons in leadership from Naval Academy Midshipmen on a Mission. Brianna Venosi reports. It's the kind of morning ritual you might expect from a military academy. This is how students at St. Benedict's Preparatory School in Newark begin each day. Arms on shoulders, united as leaders. That mentality strengthened thanks to a unique partnership that started in 2007 between the school and the U.S. Naval Academy. I graduated from here in 2017, so it's my way of giving back because uh, this community gave, did a lot for me. Joe Carmona is one of about a dozen U.S. Naval Academy midshipmen interning at St. Benedict's for a month-long leadership training program, pushing the high school students to strive for a life beyond the Newark school walls and providing the Naval Academy students with skills they'll take into service and careers. Taught me a lot as far as like leadership and learning, getting to know the kids from here. Um, I know from growing up from Kentucky, it's it's different, so it's cool to see like how different walks of life can all come together and achieve a different goal. I think it's a motivation for our, our guys. It's proven that way. We have, we'll have five this year in the Brigade of Midshipmen at the Naval Academy, five of our alums. Midshipmen go to classes with the high schoolers, offering personal stories of triumph and tragedy. Today, they're helping with college applications. You want to make yourself really competitive. A lot of people think we bring midshipmen, well, the freshmen mainly, they think we bring midshipmen to like more scare them, but it's not really that, um, that reason. Like, mainly, the midshipmen, I see them as a, as a source of leadership. It's always a benefit to see people just a little bit older than them who are, who are moving forward with their life successfully, right, in universities or, or with, a, with a job. So, so being able to see the midshipmen who come with a, not only as university students, but with a specific focus of, um, of leadership and defense of the country. They run their program similar to how the Naval Academy is run. It's very um, student-based leadership, whereas like the Naval Academy is also run by the midshipmen but also overseen by a um, you know, bigger group of people. All 550 students interact with the midshipmen. Freshmen go through a rigorous physical training session during the first week of school, called the Freshman Overnight, preparing them for a backpacking project with the Naval Academy students the last week of May, walking the Appalachian Trail from High Point to the Delaware Water Gap. We hike for 55 miles for five, in five days. And yeah, it's a, it's a hard experience, but it's also like a great experience at the same time because you learn how to work with your brothers because everybody here is our brother. It just opened my mind up to, to think as better as a person and as a student. Uh, there's a little quick story. I came from a school in my town. I went to public school, middle school, and I wasn't the greatest student. But the first week of the overnight changed my mentality like that. A sign of what can happen, tending to kids' hearts through education, testing the next fleet of leaders. The midshipman program ends in just a few weeks. Students say, though, these bonds go on for years. In Newark, Brianna Venosi, NJTV News. Now some noteworthy facts that help you know Jersey. 
The Monmouth County Sheriff's Office reports 76 percent of people in New Jersey's county jails have a substance abuse disorder. According to United Way, child care costs rose 16 percent in New Jersey between 2007 and 2014. A 2002 law mandates the teaching of African-American history in all New Jersey public schools. And New Jersey St. Benedict's Prep School was established by Benedictine monks in 1868. If there's someone who you'd like to get to know Jersey, share, use hashtag no Jersey. Tomorrow on NJTV News, the Attorney General and DEP team up to take down polluters. To share any story you've seen tonight, go to njtvnews.org. I'm Mary Alice Williams. For all the men and women of NJTV News, thanks for being here. See you tomorrow. The members of the New Jersey Education Association, making public schools great for every child. And PSE and G, we make things work for communities. Have some water. So Look at these kids. Yeah, how are you? What do you see? I see myself. I became an ESL teacher to give my students what I wanted when I came to this country. The opportunity to learn, to dream, to achieve a chance to belong and to be an American. My name is Julia Toriani Crompton and I'm proud to be an NJEA member.